Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, Trinity, Gary, United Church of Christ. I am so excited to join you here on another Tuesday at 12 noon virtual Bible study. Oh, I am so excited about today. Why? Because it is officially now two days before our Thanksgiving holy day. And so we are so excited to have another opportunity to talk about a fun topic, a fun subject, Thanksgiving, gratitude. That's right. This entire month of November, we've been focused on hashtag 30 days of thanks. And we've been reflecting on biblical passages in particular that talk about various types of gratitude that we can show and from a psychological perspective, why gratitude is so important. When we talk about gratitude, oh, first and foremost, we must begin to highlight and reflect on what does gratitude mean? First and foremost, it's important to highlight how gratitude represents or means or is defined as the quality or feeling of being grateful or thankful. Gratitude also symbolizes a feeling of thankfulness or appreciation as for gifts or favors. Thanks, thankfulness, appreciation, and gratefulness. During this entire month, we have been reflecting on hmm, important resources that will help us in our desires to be thankful. If you haven't stopped, if you haven't already gotten this book, I love for you to get this book. It's entitled uh, The Psychology of Gratitude. Just feel free to Google that. Google that, The Psychology of Gratitude. You can check it out on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Did you actually, do you know that there's actually a psychology to gratitude that impacts our physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Yes, 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 yes. That is that is correct. Did you know? Did you know? Many people don't know this, but gratitude and the ability to show gratitude has a wonderful impact on our well-being. That's why it's so important for us to talk about this. Gratitude helps us socially, physically, and emotionally. Let me give you some examples. People uh, who are grateful from a sociological standpoint are usually more helpful, more compassionate, more generous, and they feel less lonely and less isolated. They're also more forgiving and more outgoing. Yes, people who are grateful seem to have more friends. <laughs> more people want to be around them, right? Are you, are you longing for friendship, authentic, genuine relationship with others? I encourage you to try expressing gratefulness. And I want you to see how others will naturally gravitate towards that energy, that spirit that you put out. Gratitude also has an impact on our physiological well-being. Grateful people sleep more and sleep better. All those times you're tossing and turning at night, having trouble sleeping, do you know if you participate in an act of gratitude, meaning pause for a moment and show thanks for all that the divine God has given to you. It will actually help you to sleep more and sleep better. Grateful people also get sick less often, have better heart health, exercise more, and are less bothered by aches and pains. This is interesting because oftentimes when I talk to people and they say, oh, wow, I'm noticing a reoccurring theme where they're always complaining about my back is hurting, my head is hurting, I've got aches, I've got pains, my knees are hurting. I wonder to myself, hmm, I wonder how an expression of gratitude uh, can help these aches and pains. 
We also see that gratitude has an impact on our emotional being. Grateful people are happier, more optimistic, feel more joy and pleasure, feel more positive emotions, recover from stress faster. Yes. And so we want you to know that demonstrating a spirit of gratitude not only is for spiritual purposes in terms of your own spirit, but it also has some impacts on you socially, physically, and emotionally. Socially, physically, and emotionally. And so, my beloved brothers and sisters, we have been talking about the impact of gratitude in our lives this entire month. And we've picked various types of biblical stories for you to highlight and see. Today, we're going to talk about a very interesting story. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know I say that every Tuesday, but this time I actually mean it. Today, we're going to talk about a very, very, very interesting story in reference to gratitude. How many people remember the story of Jonah? How many people have read the story of Jonah in the book of Jonah? Yes, yes, yes. In the Old Testament, there's a wonderful book. It's called the book of Jonah. And it's one of the smallest books of the Bible. It's only four chapters long. It's a cool, short narrative. Now, some biblical scholars today sometimes say that story of Jonah didn't really happen. It's not a real story. And so I say, regardless of if you believe it happened or you don't believe that it happened, it still possesses some wonderful golden nuggets for us to uh, reflect on. Some people say the story of Jonah is nothing but a myth. And as we know, in many religious uh, circles in our Christian faith, it's okay because we love myths too. We lift up and love to hold on to Greek mythology. It is believed that many of our Christian stories in our Bibles today have strong underpinnings to Greek mythology. What do I mean by that? Please write this down. Please, please, please write this down. There's two Greek mythological stories that we always talk about in reference to Jonah that has a similar patterns to Jonah. Those two Greek stories are the story of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, the story of Gilgamesh, that's uh, G-I-L, G-A-M-E-S-H, G-I-L, G-A-M-E-S-H, and the Greek mythological story of Jason. That's right, J-A-S-O-N. Please do me a favor, Google Google these Greek mythological stories and you'll find some cool similar patterns between uh, the Greek story of Gilgamesh and the Greek story of Jason. And those stories will be similar in pattern of comparison to the biblical story of Jonah. And so you've heard the story of Jonah many, many times before, but I just want to highlight a couple of few key reflective facts for us. If you don't have pen and paper, I want to invite you to grab pen and paper uh, at this time. Quickly, 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 go, 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 go. Grab some pen and paper because there's a few reflective points that we're going to talk about that we're going to highlight in our story, okay? First and foremost, first and foremost, ah, we meet this brother named Jonah. Jonah is a prophet. Jonah is a prophet. And what is the definition of a prophet? A prophet has the responsibility to go and proclaim what thus says the Lord. That's their job. That's their one and only job. They have one assignment. And hopefully, many a times, they understand their assignment. Their assignment is to go and proclaim what thus says the Lord. That's what all of the prophets tend to, to do in the biblical text. We have two types of prophets that exist in the Bible. We have major prophets and we have minor prophets. 
Let's pause for a second. How do we know a prophet is a minor prophet? You ever wondered that to yourself? I got a quick joke for you. Want to know what makes a minor prophet a minor prophet and not a major prophet? A minor prophet is one under the age of 18. <laughs> okay, just kidding. That was my joke for the Tuesday. A minor prophet is termed as a minor prophet because they have a little to say. They don't have much to say. They just have a, a little to a little to say in comparison to the other prophets who had more to say, and they are now classified now as major prophets. And so Jonah is a prophet, and he understands that, generally speaking, his assignment is to go and proclaim to people, to countries, what the Lord wants people to know at a particular given time. One day, the Lord speaks to Jonah and says, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh and ask or proclaim, tell, encourage, and empower Nineveh to repent from their wicked ways or else their land will be destroyed. Now, that was Jonah's assignment. That was his assignment. He's a prophet. He's done this before. He's went to various cities and countries and towns and met with various people before. He proclaimed, but thus says the Lord. But today, in these moments, when God tells Jonah, go to the city or land of Nineveh and proclaim this, Jonah says, nope. Jonah is resistant. Jonah is defensive. Jonah is frustrated. Jonah is annoyed. Why? Because Jonah doesn't like Nineveh. Jonah can't stand Nineveh. It, in, uh, in, uh, if you were to research the historical underpinnings of Nineveh, Nineveh has been known in the past to give Jonah's people problems, to give Jonah's people grief. Nineveh has been a nation that Jonah's people have warred with in the past. Many of us all has been an enemy of uh, Jonah's people for some time. And so now Jonah doesn't want to tell Nineveh anything. Jonah doesn't want to have any type of conversations with Nineveh at all. In these moments, Jonah is not adhering to the assignment. The first reflective question for us today, beloved. Number one, first and foremost, have you ever been asked to do something that you really don't want to do? Have you ever been challenged for having to do something that you would do anything to get out of it? That's the way Jonah felt today. Our first reflective question for us, however, in light of this is, how do you push yourself? How do you understand that true ministry, true mission, true purpose is doing that which we don't want to do? You see, sometimes we live in a fairy tale. We believe a myth. We believe that everything that we're called to do are things that we like, we love. People that we're called to interact with are people that we genuinely like. Tasks that we're called to do are generally tasks that we generally like to do, want to do, yearn to do, are passionate about. But, beloved, I venture to say 99.9% of the time, that which you are called to do is hard. That which you are called to do is not easy. Oftentimes, that which you are called to do may be something that is isolated, meaning you will be called to do it all by yourself. It's interesting. Jonah is called all by himself to go to Nineveh. He doesn't have friends. He doesn't have a support network that's called to go with him. He's not going with a delegation. He doesn't have any fellow disciples. 
He doesn't have any fellow colleagues or friends going with him. He's called to go to Nineveh all by himself. He feels lonely. He feels isolated. He feels sad that he's now in a predicament where he has to do something all by himself. There's nobody to depend on, no support. No one, when he looks to his left or to his right, to carry him, to hold him up. And so the second reflective piece for us to reflect on is, yes, in addition to being called to do something that we may not want to do, and how do we learn to be okay with that? How do we also learn, number two, to be okay with doing something, even if it means we got to do it by ourselves? Even if it means we don't have a hype man or a community of support standing right behind us, how do you learn to be open to doing something, even if you have to go it alone? What is it that God is calling you to be and do that is uniquely just for you? Oftentimes, we have missions and we have purpose that we believe God is calling us to do that might be similar to other people's mission, similar to other people's purpose. But this story of Jonah reminds us, this story of Jonah reminds us that every now and then, most of the time even, or on the other hand, that which we are called to do is unique just to us. So what is it, beloved, in these moments? Can I ask you to reflect for a second? What is it that God is asking you to do? What is it that's been that thing that's been weighing heavy on your heart that you've been saying, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. You've been resistant. You've been defensive. I want to encourage you to do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Even if you have to do it angry. Even if you have to do it scared. Do it. Even if you have to do it sad. Beloved, beloved, my beloved, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. So what does our beloved Jonah do? <laughs> he refuses to do it. Even though God tells him, go to Nineveh. He says, no, I'm not going to do it. What was the reason Jonah really didn't want to do it? It's interesting. Jonah really didn't want to go to Nineveh because the word of the Lord to Jonah was, let them know that they're not doing well. And if they don't turn from their wicked ways and repent, start over life, fresh and new, being loving, being compassionate, being justice-oriented, being merciful, I'm going to destroy their land. What caused Jonah grief about this? What caused Jonah to want to be resisted? and not go to Nineveh, he didn't want the people to experience grace and mercy. That's right. That's the key dynamic. Jonah didn't want the people to have an opportunity to repent. Jonah wanted the people to be destroyed. He wanted God to do away with the people, to destroy the people. Third reflective question for us. What are the ways in which we have kept people from experiencing grace and mercy from God. In some sense, this is what Jonah is doing. Jonah is attempting to keep the people of Nineveh from repenting so that they could be destroyed because he doesn't want them to receive grace. He doesn't want them to receive mercy. He wants them to be destroyed. And so we must ask ourselves, have we been guilty of having a Jonah mentality? Have we been guilty of having a Jonah mindset where we wanted to be controllers of who receives God's grace and who receives God's mercy? Ironically, in African-centered psychology, this belief is grounded in a mentality that says the oppressed usually will later become the oppressors. The oppressed in one area of life will later become oppressors in another area of life to other people. Jonah 
what being an oppressed person in sin, in iniquity, receives grace and mercy, and is later esteemed to the office of prophet. He seems to forget that the same grace and mercy that is bestowed to him is now the same grace and mercy that he should bestow to our brothers and sisters in Nineveh. But now all of a sudden, he wants to play God. Now all of a sudden, he wants to be in control and say, hmm, they don't get to have that grace and mercy over there. Grace and mercy is good for me when I need it, but it's not good for other people when they need it. Well, to us, my beloved brothers and sisters, the same way you needed grace and mercy for your own life experiences, your own challenges, your own crisis that you face, how now do we pay it forward and bestow that same grace and mercy to others who are now in need? Woe to us for the ways in which we now want to become controllers of grace and mercy to determine who gets it and who doesn't get it. And I'm always nervous when African-American persons in particular start to do that. Why? Because not long ago in this country, it was <laughs> white persons, European American, Christian slave masters to be exact, who didn't believe that we were deserving of grace and mercy. And so white supremacy Christianity used to be taught during the period of African enslavement from 1619 to 1865 that said, you are not deserving of grace and mercy. You black Negro, you. Grace and mercy is only for us white folks. It is during the period of African enslavement where white Christian slave masters used to preach divine will regarding slavery. That's right. White Christian slave masters used to tell enslaved African and African American persons, look, it is divine will for you to be enslaved. They would misinterpret scriptures by Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter six, saying, you know how Paul, Paul professed slaves are to obey their masters. Therefore, you're a slave and you're to obey me as your white master. White slave masters would take biblical text out of context. Like Apostle Paul's Ephesians chapter 6 highlight of slaves obeying their masters. And uh, in the story of Onesimus and Philemon, Onesimus, Apostle Paul would tell him to return to his master Philemon. White Christian slave masters used to use that scripture too and say, yes, return to your masters if you run away, Harriet Tubman or Nat Turner. Because yes, that's what Apostle, Apostle Paul told Onesimus to do. He was enslaved, belonging to Philemon. And so in some sense, in some sense, how dare we as Black people who have experienced white folks Denying us of grace and mercy. Now be sexist to black women because of their gender. How dare we as black people now be homophobic to LGBTQIA persons because of their sexual orientation or gender identity and deny God's grace and mercy. Oh, we are no different. When we deny God's grace and mercy, we are no different from European white Christian slave masters from 1619 to 1865. How dare we, maybe, as financially affluent African American persons in upper class echelons of life, now deny grace and mercy, food stamps, health insurance, medical benefits to poor, unemployed, poverty stricken African American persons in our community. How dare we, as physically able-bodied Black people, now deny grace and, work and mercy and certain uh, disability rights to those who are disabled in our communities today? 
let us reflect on what are the ways in which we have to make sure that we are not becoming oppressors to others the way Jonah now became an oppressor to the town of Nineveh. Forgive us, Lord, for all the times we treated your grace and mercy like a social club where people had to apply <laughs> to receive it, where people had to go to an interview to receive it, where people had to pay dues to receive it, where people had to attend membership meetings to receive it. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways in which we turn your grace and mercy into <laughs> capitalism and said, maybe there's not enough grace and mercy to go around. <laughs> maybe there's only enough grace and mercy for these people, but not these people over here. So then, so, so our brother Jonah finally, finally says, okay, 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 okay. I gotta run away. I don't care. I don't care, God, that you're telling me to go to Nineveh. I'm gonna run away. And he runs away. He runs away. He runs away. That's right. He runs away. He runs away. He boards a boat and decides he's gonna go to another town called Jaffa. He boards a boat. And uh, ironically, what happens to this boat? He boards a boat that has uh, a group of sailors, a sailing crew on this boat. And he tells them, look, I'm trying to get away. I'm trying to go to this other city. Can you help me get away? Can you help me run? And they say, sure. Guess what happens to the boat? Right when Jonah steps foot on the boat, and he stays on the boat now to leave, to run away from the Lord, to not accept the call to go to Nineveh. Waves, billows, storms come upon this boat. The sailors get scared. The sailors get nervous. They're like, oh my God, we are now in a crisis. Everything is going fine. We were sailing along. The weather was fine. The weather was wonderful. Now, all of a sudden, we're facing storms. We're facing crisis. What is going on? Ironically, they put two and two together and garner a sense of self-awareness that their new guest that they've recently welcomed might be the reason for their crisis today. So they make a decision to throw Jonah overboard. That is an interesting point, beloved. That is an interesting detail in our text. These sailors realize my life could be different if I remove certain people out of my life. These sailors realize the storms in life that they are currently faced with are as a result of some unwanted guests in their midst. The next reflective question for us to reflect on is, how do we learn to disassociate ourselves from people who may be causing storms in our life? <laughs> how do we become self-aware? Self-aware is key. How do we become self-aware to know, hmm, some of the challenges that I'm facing in life is because I began to make space for some people who really I should let go of. I find it interesting in this text that they didn't just drop Jonah off at a nearby town or land. They literally threw Jonah overboard, not caring what physically would happen to him in this water, during this storm, not caring, not caring, not caring if he would survive, or die in the middle of this ocean. They did what they had to do to meet their best interests and to care for themselves. And so another reflective point for us, beloved, in this text is how do we let go of people and drop them off and throw them overboard from the ships of our lives? By any means necessary so that our own lives will be saved. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, I wonder, 
our, our lives in particular state because we're refusing to throw certain people overboard because we're trying to give people a second chance because we're trying to wait so there's another moment in life that's better to drop this person off from out of our lives. No, the sin of the cross, beloved, by any means necessary, let those people go. Maybe in the life of the sailors, Jonah represents something else. Maybe there's a job that you've been going to that doesn't give you peace, that's been causing you storms. I want to encourage you, look for another job. Look for another employment opportunity. Let that job go. Don't be paralyzed by that job that might be giving you stress, heartache, and pain. Maybe, 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 maybe there's particular institutions that you find yourself affiliated with. There's uh, particular groups of people, particular institutions, particular groups of people, particular networks that are causing you stress by any means necessary, just like the sailors did in this book of Jonah. I want to invite you to let it go by any means necessary. Throw it overboard off of the ship of your life. So Jonah's thrown overboard. And that's when, <laughs> that's when he comes face to face with some self-awareness for him. He comes face to face with this notion or understanding that he cannot get away from the Lord. Where can we run where God does not exist? Where can we go where the divine is not there? Are you currently in a space and place of running from the Lord, thinking that you can actually go someplace where God is not, thinking that you can actually hide? In what space can you hide from the Lord where the Lord is not already there? Jonah come, becomes face uh, to face. Jonah comes face to face with the reality that there is no hiding from God. There is no running away from the mission and purpose that God has for you in your life. The more you run, the more tragedy, calamity, crisis you will face. And in some sense, this is what happens to Jonah. In some sense, this is exactly what happens to Jonah. Jonah runs away from his mission, from his calling, from his purpose. And he meets a storm in life. And then later he will be swallowed by a giant fish. Which means he ran into more trouble and crisis running away from God rather than if he had just been obedient and did what the Lord was calling him to do. Even if he didn't want to do it. Even if he was scared to do it. Even if he didn't believe that the people were deserving of grace and mercy. What are the ways in which, another reflective question for us, we have created more calamity in our life by running away from our intended mission and purpose in life. I want to invite you, if you currently find yourself in a storm and you're wondering how to get out of this storm, I want to invite you to be obedient to that which God is calling you to do. Even if it's something you don't want to do. Even if it's something that causes you anger and scare. So our text says, Jonah is swallowed by a giant fish. Now, in popular culture today, we say that that giant fish is a whale. We say that that giant fish is a whale. But early historical writers don't actually believe that. So let's be careful. It, it wasn't a whale. Text just tells us it was a giant fish. It was a giant, it was a giant fish. But we don't exactly know what type of fish it was. And this is the point in space and place of Thanksgiving that we want to land the plane on. This is the space and place of Thanksgiving that we want to land the plane on. Jonah is swallowed by a fish. And our text says he rests in this fish three days and three nights. What do we know about that number three? It's a special number. And number three represents the Trinity. That number three represents the Trinity. So it's not lost on me that Jonah 
stays within the belly of this giant fish for three days and three nights. And while he is in that fish, the belly of this giant fish, he utter these words. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to their idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of the thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah immediately begins to pray to God for these three days and these three nights. Jonah prays to God. And if you read this book of Jonah, you will discover that these words you see on your screen, these are the last and final statements of Jonah while he's in that stomach of this giant fish. And that's very important. It's very, that's very important for us to, to remember on today. And I'll explain why in a minute. During his three days and his three nights in his belly, he's praying to God. He's praying to God for three days and three nights. He's praying to God. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, this brings up another reflective question for us. When you face crisis in life, when you find yourself in the belly of a calamity, do you pray about it? Do you go to God and petition the throne of grace? Or do you simply post about it on Facebook? Cry, complain about it on Twitter and Instagram. Do you gossip about it? Do you drink? Do you smoke over it? Do you drink over it? Do you go out and participate in unhealthy behavior because you're stressed about it? Jonah teaches us that when you find yourself in the belly of any calamity today, pray about it. Petition the throne of grace over it, first and foremost. These terms and these words that you see, these words that you see is specifically Jonah chapter two, verses two through nine, begins to highlight something very, very interesting. Something very, very interesting. These are the last and final words that Jonah utters in that fish, in the belly of this guy that fish. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you. Into your holy temple, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, with the voice of thanksgiving, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay salvation belongs to the Lord. Our theme for our Bible study series this month in light of our Thanksgiving Holy Day is gratitude and thanksgiving. And we've talked about thanksgiving from various points. Today, the point that we would like to highlight is what does it mean to give thanksgiving when you are in a calamity, when you are in crisis? Oftentimes, we've been taught Thanksgiving is that which you offer to God after you've come out of a storm, a crisis, a calamity. But think about this for a second. Jonah is actually in the belly of the fish and is giving praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Are you able to give thanksgiving to God while well, you are yet in the midst of a crisis? Or does the crisis have to be over? Does the battle have to be over for you to give thanksgiving? Does the crisis or event have to be done with in order for you to give thanksgiving? True faith, true testament of faith 
and thanksgiving and gratitude. It's can you say thank you to God while you're in the midst of a crisis or storm? When you don't know what the outcome will be, when you haven't experienced the deliverance yet, when you haven't experienced the hope yet. And so thanksgiving must also be that which we give appreciation, thankfulness, gratefulness to while we are yet still in the storm. It's interesting. What is the very next thing in our story that happens to Jonah after he says, but with the voice of thanksgiving, will I sacrifice to you? After he starts to enter into thanksgiving with God, the text will later say, um, the next verse following this will be that God will cause the fish to vomit Joseph out. God will cause the fish to vomit Joseph out. I know that sounds a little disgusting, but here's the point that we want to reflect on. And here's the point where we want to land the plane on. In the midst of your storm of crisis, maintaining a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will cause your storm of crisis to end. That's where we want to land a plan on today. Sometimes you may find yourself in a storm. But entering into that storm of praise and thanksgiving may actually be the solution that causes that storm to end. It may also be the resolution that causes that storm to cease. And so my last and final point for you, beloved. As you wrestle with storms in your life, my last and final point for you, as you wrestle with storms in your life, can you thank God right now? Can you thank God right now? A phrase that I tend to like to use is called a hallway praiser. Have you heard of that before? A hallway praiser. I love hallway praisers. What's a hallway praiser? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. A hallway praiser is one who is in the hallway of their life. A door has just closed behind them. And even though they have doors that might be in front of them, none of those doors are open or opening or currently open right now. And so they are literally in an in-between stage in their life in the hallway moment of their life. Are you in the hallway moment of your life where you're in between jobs? Are you in a hallway moment of your life where you may be single and long for a partner, but a relationship just ended and you're not anywhere close to being in a new relationship? Are you in the hallway moment of your life where you're sick in a hospital bed or dealing with some ailment or dealing with a negative report given to you by a medical doctor. The question for you today, beloved, is yet and still in this hallway moment of your life, when you're in the belly of a storm that you're facing, can you praise God and give God thanksgiving? Can you say, thank you, God, even in the midst of the hallway moment of my life, you are still good and worthy to be praised. I want to invite you to try it, beloved. Try it, try it, try it. When you, when you, when you leave, when you leave, when you leave our time together, I want to invite you, wherever you're at, in the midst of your storms and crisis in life, start thanking God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It's also what I call premeditated praise. We don't just thank God for what God has done for us, but we thank God in advance for what God is yet getting ready to do for us. Thank you, beloved, for tuning in today. I want to invite you. I want to invite you. This is our last Tuesday for our topic around gratitude and thanksgiving for our Bible study. But please, beloved, please don't let this be the end of your sense of gratitude and thankfulness. Even though we celebrate Thanksgiving once a year, we should be thankful all year round because God doesn't just bless us once a year. <laughs> God blesses us all year round. 
I want to invite you to start a gratitude journal and reflect on, reflect on, reflect on spaces and places where God has been good to you, where God has been faithful to you. Reflect on these particular journal prompts. Grab yourself a journal and answer these questions. Reflect on these journal prompts. We call them gratitude journal prompts. Sometimes when we're feeling down and out, reflecting on that which is going well for us becomes a wonderful psychological intervention to brighten our mood, to help us psychologically and emotionally. Thank you, beloved. Happy Thanksgiving to you and blessings to you. And may you never, no matter what crisis you face, no matter what belly of calamity you find yourself in today, may you never stop giving God thanks. Blessings to you.